Hi, I'm Mark Raggett uh, from ARM Architecture, and I'm here with Andrew Lillingman from ARM Architecture. And we're we're uh, directors of the practice and um, have been working on this uh, installation uh, with uh, Kaylin Tiles for Saturday in Design. Our design is a conical anamorph um, sitting over. Um, a pattern of uh, made from Kaolin's extraordinary tiles. Andrew, do you want to describe something about the, the conical anamorph? Yeah, so the installation um, is, as it appears here, sort of, as you see it firsthand, is like a mosaic shield or a kind of wheel. Um, the conical anamorph comes in with the mirror in the centre so an anamorph is really like a transformational exchange between a real-world object that is the tiles around it and what is being reflected in that 3D mirror in this version, a cone. So you can see that when, you, when you're standing in just the right position, you'll see um, in this sort of miraculous regeneration of the word um, eternity reflected when, in what is the kind of white smudge of the shield behind, becomes uh, reconfigured as that word eternity in in the conical mirror. Uh, an accident, I suppose, of that reflection, which... Uh, sorry, go on, Andrew. I suppose the fun of it is about getting to that alignment point where that thing is revealed. Yeah, that's right. You've got to find just the right spot to stand, don't you? I.e. Oh, the sweet spot, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's an idea and a, a process, I guess, that, that we in the practice have been interested in for a long time. This is a, an old project now, um, a, a, I guess a paper project, in, a conceptual project, in which um, a conical mirror is dropped into um, the plan of uh, Philip Johnson's glass house, a famous uh, house uh, he designed and built for himself in uh, Connecticut, um, which regenerates its own new plan. So you can see at the centre of that image on the left is uh, Johnson's original plan, and then um, arrayed around it is this kind of catastrophic um, plan that is the um, the image that's required to be reflected in order to re reconstitute Philip Johnson's plan, and then on the right the resultant design, which looks a little bit something like this, where the building is kind of turned inside out by the reflection of the cone in the middle, which you can see is that kind of silver Christmas tree uh, in the middle of the what is a courtyard in that plan. Um, this, I guess this, this idea of kind of reflections and optical illusions and perspectival tricks is, is um, a, an idea in the visual arts that goes back um, many, many years. In this case, this is uh, Hans Holbein, the Younger's um, very famous painting, The Ambassadors, which um, has this strange kind of incongruous smudge um, at the bottom of the image. If you stand, again, in just the right spot, which is off to the right and very obliquely to the image, this skull appears, um, uh, which is a kind of memento mori, a kind of uh, reminder of death and of um, eternity um, that is otherwise incomprehensible if you just look at the image front on, which is where you'd normally expect to be standing rather than looking at it from this oblique angle. Um, and I think that idea of um, uh, a kind of uh, a memory or incomprehensible image of eternity buried somewhere in the work is, is again, something that we've, we've had a long-term interest in as a practice. So that term and those sort of concepts um, have found their way into a few projects. This one is the Perth Arena, uh, a building that is now built. Um, and here we were looking at this idea, uh, well, the eternity puzzle, 
named that because it would take that long to work it out. It is 200, 209 different individual pieces. Um, it turns out it doesn't take an attorney. It takes a, a, a couple of math wizards a couple of months to work it out. Um, however, for us, uh, we used it to create the building into um, by taking those puzzle pieces and um, reconfiguring them into a, a, a arena-type form. Um, so anamorphic uh, projection found its way into this project as well in the interiors, but also out the front of the building. Here, as you arrive, you can see on the left there, you arrive, there is an entry canopy, and um, that entry canopy is a projection of the two front pieces of that puzzle. So the blue one, which we call the horse's head, and the white one to the right there, which is called we were calling the bird or the swan, that is projected flat into this canopy form. So at some point as you arrive, the two of them line up and um, sort of shadow each other or, or um, yeah, eclipse each other. So it, it becomes a sort of revealing moment for the building, in this case a sort of wireframe version of those, those pieces and, and a sort of strange kind of coexistence between the canopy and the building. They, they sort of shift around. They have this sort of kind of projection or unpeeling of, of the facade into a flat plane. It's an interesting experience, isn't it? Because you you get this first sense of going. It's it's utterly incon it's it's utterly incomprehensible. But mm -hmm. as you kind of approach that sweet spot, it becomes m more and more likely, or more and more, uh, it, it becomes closer and closer to you. The, this sense that oh, there's something there. There's something there to be found. As there's a discovery, and you're looking for that spot where suddenly everything comes together into this kind of this conceptual drawing that traces over the the, the figures of the building. It's a it's an interesting experience, but again, it's that that a building is not only experienced in, you know, websites and magazines, but something that is experienced, you know, kind of bodily, isn't it? You have to stand in that in that very spot. I think this one was um, is it St Peter's, um, where you sort of stand in the in the main um, um, uh, forecourt, and all the columns align together. And there are these sort of dots in the pavement where you can stand and, and have that experience. So it's a sort of, um, it's kind of urban uh, idea as well. Mm. Um, for Sydney, of course, the, that word eternity has its own meaning and, and legend. Arthur Stace was a, a, a nearly illiterate um, veteran who used to get up at the crack of dawn and go out and, and write this word, eternity, uh, in chalk all over the city. Uh, it's said as a kind of calling, a kind of evangelism. And it was a bit of a mystery as, as to who he was for many years because he, he did it before anyone was, you know, everyone was still in their beds. But And so he was sort of known as Mr. Eternity, this, this sort of mysterious figure. and. We're very interested in this, this uh, the stories of the city um, and the mythologies and legends of a city that build up to form the kind of identity of a of a place or, or of a or, or of a country, and um, this this uh, kind of humble graffiti eventually ended up, you know, writ large across the the Harbour Bridge, um, and yet it has this this uh, frugal subversive underground uh, foundation and so it, it seemed like exactly the right uh, kind of image for us to borrow when we came to think about this uh, this installation and so here you see on the left um, a diagram of the conical catoptic um, anamorph um, and then our version of it on the right um, on the left, it would have been transcribed uh, by hand and on the right, uh, generated digitally 
um, from uh, inputs, which which kind of put output the kind of correct um, the correct uh, kind of transcription of that original image. And did you want to talk? Did you want to add anything to that process? Yeah. Well, I think anyone who who's done technical drawing would know the the sort of um, type of construction required for the thing on the 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 left, and obviously it's just rays of um, uh, projection from your eye um, reflected off that cone in the middle, and then um, um, projected out at a at a at an angle, equal angle. Um, uh, onto that grid, so the grid the grid gives away the distortion or the um, transformation, and probably more more clear way to us than the actual object. And and equally, when you look at the one that we did on the computer, um, no, uh, the grid kind of helps us understand that sort of transformation. Whereas eternity in um, uh, in its kind of projected form is totally incomprehensible. It's only through that sort of trans that sort of translation device, the mirror, that it makes the incomprehensible suddenly readable, suddenly comprehensible. Mm. And and only if you look at it in just the right way. Um, and I suppose this idea of translation and of um, um, material quality is something again that we we return back to um, here a project for the Victorian Arts Centre uh, their lounges which were underground um, and uh, I guess a kind of a game of translation here in which a wall that could be marble is made literally of glass marbles ARM in that year became the largest importer of glass marbles in Australia, and these were then suspended in resin, along with many other kind of intriguing objects that you could find. In this case, a set of pearls, but equally you'd find children's toys, um, an expired parking meter, and all sorts of other um, strange and interesting artifacts uh, fossilized in these marble panels. The recital centre, uh, again, here we explored the idea of um, material, the sort of idea of the precious versus the disposable. Here the facade replicates that idea of a, a, a styrofoam packaging, and it, which in itself, styrofoam packaging, obviously suggests the precious object in which it, it is housing, that is taken care of. So this idea that a recital uh, centre that um, has a sort of beyond that line of the facade, there is some special interior, special thing inside that the building is kind of looking after. And here we recreated the styrofoam, obviously in, in super huge scale, using um, a GRC, a kind of concrete product, uh, which is sort of moulded into panels. And then some of those other things like glass and um, uh, replicate those sort of bubble packing and, and all those sort of ideas. So as you're going, Mark, to the next slide, that interior, the recital centre, our recital centre is the one on the right there. Um, obviously it is proportioned in kind of classical recital hall format, that sort of square box. And we were interested in the surface of that um, box, obviously working not only in an acoustic um, uh, way in, in terms of what it needed to do to perform as a, as a recital space, but also aesthetically as well. And it takes a lot from those historical examples of the sort of ornate um, and, and the beautiful uh, interior. So here we recreated that by using um, plywood, which is actually sort of layered up. And we were thinking about that special object like the um, violin, you know, the beautiful violin in a violin case. And we recreated a sort of super scale of wood out of plywood 
um, in order to achieve both sort of aesthetic, you know, qualities to that interior, um, as well as the acoustic performance. It has that thing of being kind of humble in that it's all just cut plywood and then also being unbelievably rich as a, as a space, you know, and, and ornate as a space, much, much like the music for Ryan on the left. You know, it has this kind of inherent richness and yet a material humility in the plywood. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an interesting flip there that it doesn't rely on gold and gilt and crystal chandeliers to make it rich. It's the, it's the material quality, kind of, or the, the, the experience of the material itself that brings that richness. And it's got, when you're in there, it's got an a overwhelming kind of quality of, um, as you say, richness and detail uh, to the point that in the grain of the, the wood, which is sort of cut into layers, uh, we were hiding other little imageries um, like, you know, their ears and I think eyes and a few faces and those sort of things. So there's, there's this sort of peering into the surface as well, which I think is what you do in those uh, more ornate halls. There's so much detail, there's figures and all sorts of things going on in there that you don't experience at first glance. I always feel like that's like, it's like seeing the face of Jesus in your soup or something, you know, you're not quite sure if you really saw, if you really saw that or not. Well, you want, yeah, you want those surprises. Um, yeah. Well, this one's a pretty surprising one. Again, this is, this is a, an old ARM one that I think predates both of us, Andrew. Um, but it's, it's the Kronborg Clinic, um, which is the drawing on the bottom. And the process was to take um, the famous house up on the left, with it, which is Robert Venturi's house uh, for his mother, uh, the Vanna Venturi house. And that photograph of the house is dragged across a photocopier as it is photocopying. And so you get that um, catastrophic smudgy image on the right, which is not yet architecture um, and requires kind of translation into architecture. And, and, and that... The method for that is material and drawing, um, translating the image into that kind of material constructible, constructible thing, which the image you can see uh, in the image below, which the result of that is this little building here. Again, humble, um, but rich in ideas and um, material quality and experience. One thing probably worth drawing attention to is that sort of black box sticking out the front, which of course in the original is inverted. It's it's a niche and entry into the building, whereas here it is a projection um, and part of the interior space. As if in in making that translation of the photocopy photocopier, we made a mistake that. It looked like a projection, and we misunderstood it as as a niche. And and of course, these things happen when you're trying to translate one thing into another. Mistakes are made. This is the administration building of the um, National Museum of Australia. The facade is clad in coloured tiles, many of which are black. And in this case, those tiles form a QR code a uh, within the mosaic and um, we have this I guess this interest in the mosaic as as forming a kind of image and and pointing beyond the building in this case a QR code quite literally pointing beyond the building into the internet um, and if you click on the draw you can use your phone uh, to to uh, to find out where that takes you, um, but I guess again that idea of the kind of mosaic, not only the not just the material itself, but what might be made out of that material and how that material might then be expressed to to kind of consolidate into something else, into some other image or expression. This project's uh, the atrium at Arts West at um, Melbourne Uni. And this is a, 
a fantastic project in terms of its exteriors and interiors where it explores kind of the art of surface uh, in, in fantastic ways. Here, this is the main atrium space, the entry space, which I think really kind of threads together the external um, thoroughfares outside uh, and plazas into the building. So you get that sort of brick kind of creeping in and then kind of merging in with um, a, a stone, uh, a beautiful stone um, kind of um, forecourt or entry court and then those sort of arcaded um, columns coming in as well. So we we often kind of use materials to kind of uh, create those sort of transitional uh, spaces or experiences as people are moving through from one to the next, um, but also, again, giving it that kind of ornate mosaic or traditional feeling that you experience in, you know, so many kind of cathedrals around the world. Um, those sort of um, ornate uh, floorings. Which I guess brings us full circle um, back to the Kaolin um, installation, which is this, again, a kind of um, a, a kind of mosaic, but also a kind of bringing, of bringing the world into the design. So not, not a kind of hermetic thing, but something that kind of brings these other references and these other thought processes um, into the design itself, particularly, I guess, through that word eternity, but also through this kind of mosaic pattern pointing out to kind of other architectural um, uh, histories and, and stories as well. And I suppose uh, the science um, and mathematics of, of illusions and of how we, how we see and how we perceive the world.